Eel here with another Performance PCs video. This time it involves mechanical keyboard kits. I've designed a series of sandwich style kits out of acrylic for the DIYers out there. I'm just assembling the feet for the kit itself. It includes all the hardware, threaded inserts, the rivet nuts, and of course the countersunk screws themselves. The kits are produced using frosted clear acrylic in a variety of sizes. This particular kit that I'm building is a so-called default 60% size layout. Mostly just for proof of concept. The kits I designed are a bit more unique in that the switch cutouts, namely the stabilized keys, on the right side, the enter key and the shift key. Most of the time with the typical sandwich kits that are available out there, they tend to have that area completely cut out and you have to solder the switches directly on the PCB itself, mostly because of the stabilizer situation. The kits I designed work hand-in-hand hand with the Everglide brand stabilizers that work really well and it allows the switches there, the enter key and the shift key, to have an additional material to mount onto, just like all the other switches on the deck. What I'm doing here is uh, installing the Everglide stabilizers themselves. I had pre-prepped the PCB with some of our stab pads, vinyl stickers, used to reduce the sound of the stabilizers as they hit the PCB itself. Ideally, you want to lube stabilizers, but uh, in the interest of time, I'm not doing that for this video. I'm just building a typical vanilla keyboard here. I'm going to be using T1 tactile switches. They're very nice, cheap switches. They really shine when you tune them, namely with lube and or spring swap and switch films. Obviously I'm not doing that here. I'm just building straight from factory. All right, let's get started. I'm speeding the film up to make it a little less annoying and boring. I go ahead and put on the top layers of the kit that act as the switch plate. What I tend to do is our solder in the corners themselves, switches in the corners to kind of hold everything together and I'll put some in the middle to reduce strain on those joints as I'm moving, moving the deck around. That way everything will kind of be held in place to allow the soldering to happen. And then I will go row by row, soldering switches in to increase the strength overall so the whole thing doesn't fall apart, hopefully.
once I get some of the switches installed, then I can go ahead and solder them. I'm not going to sit here and teach you how to solder or anything like that, but just use common sense. Make sure you're not touching anything on the back of the PCB that you shouldn't be touching. It should just be the solder pads only. Be mindful not to touch anything else, like RGB LEDs or resistors or things of that sort. All right. Those are held in place. I think I missed one in the middle there. Yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and take care of that. Yeah, that one in particular, you gotta be mindful to not mess up the USB port itself. And then I will go along and start popping in the rest of the switches on that particular row. I tend to stagger them. I will go down the middle and then go down the the bottom row, you know, again, just to kind of distribute the strength a bit to make it easier to solder the whole thing. Plus to make sure nothing gets moved out of whack. solder domes I prefer using 6644.5 millimeter solder, mostly because it's just nice and small and flows easily, and it's cheap. And then the event of needing to fix something, it's easy to flow back out and remove the solder. All right, I'll go ahead and take care of the bottom row here. Mostly because the bottom row on these PCBs look like Swiss cheese because of all the layout support. Not a whole lot of spot to grab onto in some of the switch locations too, like the space bar. I have to actually kind of hold the PCB down, pushing down on it and holding it with my hand to be able to solder it in place. Kind of annoying, but it is what it is. All right, moving right along. Pop in another row of switches here.
Obviously, I'm soldering switches here. But I know a lot of people prefer using hot swap. I'm personally not that big on it. I I can I'm very sensitive and I can feel the switches moving in their sockets a bit. So that's why I prefer hard soldered. But again, to each their own. You might be able to get away with using a hot swap PCB in these kits, but I'm really not sure. Obviously, I haven't tested it myself. And again, this is a, a kit. It's literally just the case with the option of purchasing the PCB along with it if you need it. The stabilizers if you need them. We may offer a variety of switches, really not sure. We're just kind of feeling things out right now to see. I just chose these T1 switches because they were readily available, they were completely transparent, and they were cheap. But again, you can use any MX style switch. The usual Cherry brand, uh, Kale brand, Gatoron. There's all kinds of varieties, variety of switches out there. I'm kind of a silent tactile person myself. Or silent linear for gaming rigs. But to each their own. Nice solder domes moving right along. If you're building a mechanical keyboard, most likely you know that they are programmable. The majority of the PCBs that are released nowadays are QMK compatible. Most likely they already have a profile available for them and pre-flashed from factory with some kind of layout. Uh, this particular PCB, for some reason, the default layout was working, but the function key to switch layers was not programmed, nor the in-switch backlighting. So I had to go in and reflash it to make sure that the backlighting was enabled. Personally, I'm not big on backlighting itself, um, mostly because I tend to use higher end keycap sets that don't support backlighting. But you know, if, if you're into that, that's that's great. You know, keyboards can look really cool with the backlighting. But for the visual pop, I will be installing LEDs on this just for just for that uh, visual appeal.
go ahead and pop in the USB cable to check it. I'm checking the switches here. I tend to use a program called Switch Hitter that is available out there for free. Just Google it. I prefer using it because it's, it's great. It gives you a visual layout of the switch itself. Like here, we're using the 60% layout, so all these keys, except for the function row and the tilde, will show up. Obviously, I needed to reprogram this in order to make sure the function switch itself was mapped and the in switch LED backlighting was enabled and the underglow itself. All right, let's start on some LEDs now. Right here I'm going to be soldering in the caps lock just to make sure everything's working. Well, it takes a little bit of heat and then it's ready to go. Plug that in. Check it. All right, now I'm starting on the first row of LEDs. This tends to get really tedious. What I usually do is, just like the switches, I'll go row by row, except I'll solder in one row of LEDs and plug it in to make sure that they light up. This is always a possibility of getting a bad LED. Of course, you can prevent this by taking a little three volt battery and uh, try touching the legs on the LED to, get, to see if they light up. Obviously, if the LED is bad, it won't light up. So that's one way to save some time. Personally, I'm impatient, so I'll go ahead and just run through the rows, soldering them in, and if I get a bad one, so be it. I'll go ahead and remove it and replace it. There's always a possibility of getting a bad LED, especially with the cheap LEDs that are available in the marketplace. It's bound to happen, just like switches. There's always a possibility of having a bad one. Go ahead and plug that in. Flip it around and what do you know, it works. All right, so that's good. I'm gonna go along and snip all the LED legs off. I'm 
and then move on to the next one. Sometimes you may need to flip the PCB around upside down, you know, if it allows you to get at solder pads from a certain angle to avoid burning out anything else on the PCB. Whatever works. Now you can do a handstand and solder if you need to. It's all up to you. Alright, everything looks good there. One row at a time. Be mindful where you're sticking the soldering iron tip. You should be good. Let's finish up that bottom row. Only have those switches left. Okay, it looks like Swiss cheese. All right, let's plug that in and check the bottom row. Everything should be good. Let's see. Every switch is lighting up. And I'm done. Alright, now to actually assemble the rest of the case. Once you've had the PCB with the switches soldered on, on the couple of the top layers. You just need the base with the feet installed. Drop in the center piece and then drop in the plate and PCB assembly and then the top layer itself. And then just carefully start threading in the screws. I tend to then start installing the corners first and then just kind of evenly distribute everything and that way you can kind of walk everything into place where it's all supposed to sit. And then once everything looks good to you, let's go ahead and start tightening down the screws gently and then you should be good. And start dropping on your keycaps of choice. These are just some economical cherry profile backlit keycaps. Show off the backlighting. Now let's plug that in and see how everything looks. Come on, plug it in. 
There we go. Underglow is working. Now if I program this correctly, backlighting should turn on. Let's flip the lights off in the room to see how everything looks. There we go. So pretty. Change the underglow RGB. Everything's working great. On behalf of Performance PCs, we greatly appreciate you watching, we appreciate your patronage, and we hope you're staying safe.